In July, 239 scientists signed an open letter to the World Health Organization declaring their belief that COVID-19 can be transmitted by small aerosol particles that linger in the air much longer than previously believed. Among the signers is Jordan Pechia of Yale. When a person emits a particle, whether it's through coughing or sneezing or talking loudly or singing, we typically try to divide the particles that they emit into two types of modes or distributions. One of them will be small particles. These are particles that are going to be less than at least five micrometers in diameter. We call these aerosols. And then there's going to be a larger set of particles, probably greater than 50 micrometers in diameter, around 100 micrometers in diameter. Potentially, we call these droplets. So droplets are big. You can almost see them. And when they fall, they fall fast. It takes those particles 10, 15 seconds to hit the ground, whereas it may take hours for an aerosol particle to hit the ground. Well, so if a droplet is, let's say it's 100 microns in diameter, and the SARS-CoV-2 virus is about 30 nanometers in diameter, you could hit, fit a lot of these viruses into that big droplet. Um, and when you fit a lot of these drop viruses, there can be many more of them that are infectious in that droplet. They can have some sort of environmental protections in that droplet because it's slower to evaporate as well. Um, in aerosols, when you get down to the few micron range or below that, there's gonna be a lot fewer viruses and chances are there'll be a lot fewer infectious viruses in those aerosols. So on a particle to particle basis, absolutely the droplets are gonna be much more potent. For the small particles though, they're not quite as potent because there may not be many, many of them all clumped together. There may just be one or two or a few of them, but they're gonna stay airborne. And there's a lot of them as well. And so they can stay airborne, they can float around. And potentially if the air currents are right, if the situation is, is appropriate, they could transmit the disease to a person completely across the room. Like many things in nature, um, the survival of a virus in air, an enveloped virus in air, and we know this mostly through studies with influenza, is impacted by the relative humidity. But it's not just a single straight line, i.e. relative humidity higher, more survival, relative humidity lower, less survival, it's a U-shaped curve. Up at the top there, at 95% or very high relative humidity, when a virus gets uh, emitted, it does pretty well in the air in high, high relative humidity. But as that humidity starts to tick down, 80, 70, 60%, the virus doesn't do well and it's inactivated pretty quickly. But the curve starts going back up quite steeply when you get around to 50%, which is where most air conditioned buildings are. And below 50% relative humidity and relatively dry conditions, the virus will last for long, long periods of time and it isn't inactivated easily. So N95 masks help no matter what, because N95 masks fit closely to your face they um, can seal off enough that they can dramatically reduce not just the big droplet particles, but also the small aerosol particles. So N95 masks are great. Surgical masks are not great at protecting you against the aerosol side of things, but they are good at protecting people from emitting the droplets and from um, allowing you to be exposed to those droplets. I think they're a good idea, and I think they go a long ways to reduce risk.